Melissa is a 21-year-old college student who's having the time of her life at a party. It's late, and unfortunately, she has class the next morning, so she drinks a ton of coffee to sober up. On her way out, Melissa collapses to the floor, but wakes up after a couple of seconds. On her way to the emergency room, she tells the paramedics that she's aware of her heartbeat. Then comes Taylor, a 32-year-old female who is brought to the emergency room by her partner because she suddenly collapsed for a couple of minutes while cooking dinner. Taylor's now awake, and she tells you that right before collapsing, she was feeling dizzy and like her heart was racing, but now she's fine. They're both placed on different monitors. Melissa's heart rate is 200 beats per minute and regular, and this is Melissa's ECG. On the other hand, Taylor's heart rate is 80 beats per minute and regular, so everything seems fine. However, her ECG shows this. All right, so both Melissa and Taylor have experienced palpitations and syncope, and their ECGs reveal they both have some form of arrhythmia. The best way to approach arrhythmias is to first know what a normal ECG looks like, and second, have a good classification system to narrow down the diagnosis. First, let's review the normal electrical conduction pathway in the heart and how it looks on an ECG. An ECG tracing specifically shows how the depolarization wave flows through the heart during each heartbeat. The normal electrical activity of the heart starts in the sinoatrial or SA node and is then conducted through the atrium creating the P wave on ECG. From the atrium, electrical activity goes to the atrioventricular or AV node, after which it goes through the bundle of His. Then, the right and left branches of the bundle, and finally, through the Purkinje fibers, which deliver the current to the right and left ventricles. On an ECG, this will create the QRS complex, which represents the depolarization of the ventricles, and finally, the T wave, which represents the repolarization of the ventricles. To help identify an irregular rhythm, you can look at the morphology of the waveform and make sure that there is a P wave before every QRS complex and a QRS complex after every P wave. Now let's take a look at the heart rate. The resting heart beats at a rate between 60 to 100 times per minute, and each of those beats starts off with depolarization of the sinoatrial node, and so we call it a normal sinus rhythm. For your exams, you should be able to figure out the heart rate on an ECG. To do that, you can count the number of boxes between R waves. Each small box represents 0.04 seconds, and each big box is five small boxes, so each big box is 0.2 seconds. One quick way to estimate the heart rate on an ECG is to remember that the heart rate is 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, or 50, depending on whether there's one, two, three, four, five, or six boxes between R waves. It's important to know that there is normally a delay in conduction at the AV node and the bundle of His, which gives some time for ventricular filling before the ventricle contracts. On the ECG, this is represented by the PR interval, which should be less than five small boxes, or 200 milliseconds. Now, any disturbance in the rate, rhythm, site of origin, or conduction of the cardiac electrical activity is called an arrhythmia. Arrhythmias can be completely asymptomatic and be picked up incidentally on an ECG. Arrhythmias can also present with palpitations, which is an awareness of one's heartbeat. Additionally, they may alter cardiac output, causing individuals to present with signs of hypotension and decreased brain perfusion, like dizziness, altered mental status, or syncope. If an arrhythmia is really fast, the heart now demands more oxygen, and if oxygen supply is not met, then the myocardium suffers from ischemia, which presents as angina. In people with underlying heart disease, the sudden onset of an arrhythmia can precipitate acute heart failure. Finally, some arrhythmias may even cause sudden cardiac death. Now, arrhythmias can be classified into those originating from above the ventricles, so supraventricular arrhythmias, and those originating in the ventricles, so ventricular arrhythmias. In general, what's important to remember is that supraventricular arrhythmias have a narrow QRS complex because there's a rapid excitation of the ventricles, which means the arrhythmia is originating above or within the bundle of His.
On the other hand, ventricular arrhythmias have a wide QRS complex because there's a slower spread of ventricular depolarization. The first type of supraventricular arrhythmia includes those with sinus origin. So first, there's sinus tachycardia, which is a heart rate above 100 with a regular rhythm and normal P waves before each QRS complex. It can be physiological, like during exercise, or pathological. Pathological sinus tachycardia happens when the heart needs to compensate for an acute decrease in stroke volume, like in acute heart failure, acute myocardial infarction, or pulmonary embolism. It can also result from any overwhelming activation of the sympathetic nervous system, like in hyperthyroidism or cocaine or amphetamine use. Now, the thing is that a fast heart rate decreases diastolic filling time, which actually further decreases the stroke volume. Additionally, over time, catecholamines are actually toxic to the myocytes, which results in a form of cardiomyopathy called tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, which is a super creative name. Okay, but on the other hand of the spectrum, we have sinus bradycardia. Keep in mind that this can be completely physiological in athletes who have a resting heart rate between 40 and 60, and it's also normal during sleep. Pathological causes of sinus bradycardia include hypothyroidism, anorexia nervosa, and inferior wall myocardial infarctions. Another high-yield cause of bradycardia is the Cushing reflex, which includes the characteristic triad of bradycardia, hypertension, and an irregular respiratory pattern. This reflex occurs as a consequence of increased intracranial pressure, which can manifest from a variety of pathologies, like head trauma, strokes, and brain tumors. For your exams, note that Cushing triad may indicate impending brain herniation, and thus, it is a medical emergency. Other causes of sinus bradycardia include a bunch of medications like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and opiates, in which case the solution is discontinuing the medication if possible. Acute sinus bradycardia can be treated with IV atropine, while chronic and severe cases might need a pacemaker. Another arrhythmia of sinus origin is, well, sinus arrhythmia. <laughs> this arrhythmia can occur naturally during inspiration and expiration. See, during inspiration, the heart rate increases, and during expiration, it decreases. So on ECG, the rhythm may appear irregular, but it is in fact a normal variant. Finally, sinus arrest, or sinus exit block, occur when the sinus node fails to fire. What you need to know is that on an ECG, there is simply a flat line pause. Fortunately, if the sinus node can't press that reset button, somebody else, like the AV node or virtually any other myocardial cell, can take over. All right, now the second type of supraventricular arrhythmias are reentrant arrhythmias. In this type, electrical activity is literally trapped in a circular electric racetrack, altering normal conduction. To understand this, let's picture a single myocyte with two branches, triggering two adjoining pathways, one and two. Under normal circumstances, electrical activity starts on the SA node and then travels from one myocyte to the other. Now, the wave of depolarization should go through both one and two at the same speed, but let's say pathway two was damaged during a myocardial infarction. Now that pathway two is slowed down, the wave of depolarization rushes through pathway one and then returns backwards through pathway two. This creates an electrical loop that is now independent of the SA node, meaning it can pretty much run itself now. There are three must-know subtypes of re-entrant supraventricular arrhythmias paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, or PSVT, atrial flutter, and atrial fibrillation. PSVT is usually caused by a re-entrant circuit that loops within the AV node, which is why it's also referred to as an AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. PSVT can happen in people with totally normal hearts and no history of cardiac disease. A clue to this can be recent consumption of things like alcohol and coffee. On the ECG, PSVT appears as a regular rhythm with a rate ranging between 150 and 250 beats per minute, and a narrow QRS complex, 
The key is the absence of normal P waves, which tells us that the SA node is no longer in control. Now, the re-entrant circuit is within the AV node, meaning it can go from the AV node up towards the atria. Since it's going in the opposite direction, you may be able to see retrograde P waves. However, because the PSVT is super fast, these retrograde P waves are usually buried in the QRS complex, so you may or may not see them. PSVTs are classically treated with vagal maneuvers, like carotid massage. When the carotid artery is massaged, the carotid sinus is stimulated, which stimulates the vagus nerve to fire. This slows conduction through the AV node, which interrupts the reentrant circuit, effectively slowing the heart rate and terminating the arrhythmia. Now, if vagal maneuvers don't work, the next step for treatment is adenosine, and this is commonly tested. Adenosine rapidly acts in about 15 seconds, causing a decrease in AV node conduction. Keep in mind that its effect is blunted by theophylline and caffeine. Another important thing to remember are its side effects, which include facial flushing, hypotension, bronchospasm, and chest pain. Moving on, atrial flutter is usually caused by a re-entrant circuit that runs around the annulus of the tricuspid valve. On ECG, this usually appears as a regular rhythm with an atrial heart rate ranging between 250 and 350 beats per minute. Now, because of this super fast atrial heart rate, the AV node cannot handle all these impulses coming at it, so some impulses get through, and some don't. This generates what's called an atrial-ventricular conduction ratio, which is usually 2 to 1, meaning one impulse gets through to the ventricles and the next does not, and so on. So, let's say the atrial heart rate is 300. The ventricular rate would then be 150. The AV conduction ratio can be 3 to 1 or even 4 to 1. Okay, so on ECG, the giveaway will be flutter waves, which are P waves that give off a sawtooth appearance. Now, because the re-entrant circuit is not within the AV node like in PSVT, vagal maneuvers will not work here, simply because the vagus nerve isn't innervating where the arrhythmia started. Instead, medications or electrical cardioversion is required to keep atrial flutter under control, while definitive treatment can be done with catheter ablation. Okay, so in atrial flutter, there was a single reentrant circuit causing the problem. On the other hand, in atrial fibrillation, there are hundreds of reentrant circuits scattered around the atria. The most common risk factors are hypertension and coronary artery disease. Another interesting cause is the holiday heart syndrome, where atrial fibrillation occurs after binge drinking. Now, for your exams, remember that here, the atrial heart rate is really fast, going above 500 beats per minute, so on the ECG, no P waves are seen. The poor AV node is seriously overwhelmed now, so we don't even get an AV conduction ratio. Instead, the AV node allows impulses to pass in a random and unpredictable fashion. On the ECG, this typically appears as an irregularly irregular rhythm, which means the QRS complexes will have no pattern at all, with a ventricular rate usually ranging between 120 and 180 beats per minute. The name fibrillation implies that the atrial muscles are shaking uncontrollably, meaning there is no actual atrial contraction. Now, atrial contraction only contributes to about 10 to 20% of the cardiac output, but in an individual with a history of cardiac disease, that 20% might be crucial. Another high yield fact is that the absence of a true contraction causes stasis of blood flow in the atrial compartment, and this increases the risk of clot formation, especially in the left atrial appendage. This clot can dislodge and travel into the systemic circulation, causing multiple potentially life-threatening pathologies like embolic strokes, acute limb ischemia, central retinal artery occlusion, or acute mesenteric ischemia. Therefore, individuals often need treatment with anticoagulants, in addition to treating the arrhythmia itself with medications like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Finally, some individuals can be treated with cardioversion. A third type of supraventricular arrhythmia is ectopic rhythms, in which electrical activity may originate from a place other than the sinus node. 
Basically, fastest one to fire gets to be the pacemaker of the heart. If any myocardial cell gets a bit ambitious and starts firing faster than the SA node, then it can overtake the SA node as the pacemaker of the heart. A type of supraventricular arrhythmia with ectopic origin is multifocal atrial tachycardia, or MAT, which usually results from multiple ectopic foci firing from the atrium. MAT is classically associated with lung disease like asthma or COPD, so be sure to look for that in the question stem. On ECG, this also appears as an irregularly irregular rhythm at a rate of around 100 to 200 beats per minute. However, unlike atrial fibrillation, P waves are present in MAT. But because the P waves are originating from multiple sites in the atrium, they often vary in shape, and so will the PR intervals. In order to diagnose MAT, you need to identify at least three different P wave morphologies on ECG. Now, before we wrap things up, we should talk about pre-excitation syndromes, which may ultimately lead to supraventricular arrhythmias especially PSVT. In pre-excitation syndromes, there's an accessory pathway that acts as a shortcut to the normal electrical circuit, causing the ventricles to be excited earlier than usual. The most important pre-excitation syndrome is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, or WPW. People with WPW are born with an additional conduction pathway between the atria and the ventricles called the Bundle of Kent. The cause of WPW is most often unknown, whereas a few cases are inherited through an autosomal dominant mutation of the PRKAG2 gene, which helps regulate ion channels specific to cardiac tissue. The three major changes on ECG in WPW are shortening of the PR interval, widening of the QRS complex, and presence of a delta wave, which is an upward slurring of the initial portion of the QRS complex. The delta wave indicates that the ventricle is being activated earlier than it normally should. Now, most people remain asymptomatic despite having this classic ECG pattern, whereas a small number can develop arrhythmias that can manifest as palpitations, dizziness, syncope, and even sudden cardiac death. All right, as a quick recap, an arrhythmia is any disturbance in the rate, rhythm, site of origin, or conduction of the cardiac electrical impulse. Arrhythmias can be classified, based on their origin, into supraventricular arrhythmias, which have a narrow QRS complex, or ventricular arrhythmias, which have a wide QRS complex. Supraventricular arrhythmias can be of sinus origin. This includes sinus tachycardia, which is a heart rate above 100, with a regular rhythm and normal P waves before each QRS complex and sinus arrhythmia, which is a normal phenomenon that reflects the changes in heart rate during inspiration and expiration. Supraventricular arrhythmias can also have a re-entrant origin. This includes PSVT, a regular rhythm with a narrow QRS complex and an absence of normal P waves, atrial flutter, a regular rhythm with P waves that give off a sawtooth appearance, and atrial fibrillation, an irregularly irregular rhythm with no P waves. Finally, supraventricular arrhythmias can have an ectopic origin like multifocal atrial tachycardia, which is an irregularly irregular rhythm with present P waves. An important cause of supraventricular arrhythmias are pre-excitation syndromes, like Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, in which an accessory pathway acts as a shortcut that causes the ventricles to be excited earlier than usual. Okay, back to our cases. Both Melissa and Taylor's presentations describe syncope and palpitations, suggesting something is going on with their hearts. Based on Melissa's ECG, this is likely a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, or PSVT. In her case, it was likely triggered by her consumption of alcohol and caffeine. After a carotid massage is performed, her ECG converts back to a normal sinus rhythm. On the other hand, Taylor's ECG shows a short PR interval and a wide QRS complex with an initial delta wave, which is the classic ECG pattern of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.